We were having a bit of a conversation before we started about what is an extreme environment. And uh, I think already started to come up with some interesting definitions on that. What, what constitutes somewhere that's extreme enough that you might call it exploration when you're going there and not just research? And, and where does research and exploration connect in, in these environments? Um, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that, but we do have, we have some terrific speakers, which is one of the reasons that Katie persuaded me to come along here. The other reason is that I love this topic and I love this place. I've spent a lot of time here and it always feels like coming home, so it's a, it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to do that again. So thanks to Katie for that. Um, but we do have fabulous speakers who uh, know a lot about different aspects of exploration, who can speak about the Arctic, Antarctic, and, and about space. And these are three of the, th the, the very uh, significant, if you like, uh, extreme environments that might immediately come to mind when you're thinking about that. And one suggestion for what makes an extreme environment is it's a place where <clears throat> how, how long could you survive as a human without any life support or intervention? And if that's in the sort of weeks or months or years, then it's probably not that extreme. And if that's in the minutes or seconds or milliseconds, then it's probably pretty extreme. So that's quite a, a nice definition. And another one is what's the nature of, of your relationship with it? You, can, you, can you survive there, but, but you, you know that your survival is always contingent? You always have to know something about the place, have a real relationship with it, and at any moment it might be able to spit you out. And that's the kind of extreme that might apply to somewhere like high mountains or the, the Arctic, but doesn't really apply to places like Antarctica or space. There are places, Antarctica, one of the reasons I was so captivated by Antarctica is it's one of the few places on Earth where you really have to take your own life support with you or you'll die. If you go into the interior of Antarctica, you don't have food or water or shelter or clothing. You have nothing, you just have ice, which is one of the reasons that I love it. So, so that's just a little comment about what we might mean by extreme environments. And, and I'm hoping that we can have an, a conversation about uh, what constitutes exploration. If you're going there for professional reasons to do sensible research, does that take exploration out of the picture? Is there any romance left in these places? And should we be going there anyway? They're expensive, they're difficult, they're complicated. And in this day, aren't there easier ways of getting that kind of information? Um, and where does our humanity sit in all of these questions? So that's some of the areas that I hope that we might uh, cover tonight with our, our distinguished panel. And uh, the way that the format is going to work is each of our panelists will say a few words, as I just have, about uh, their, their feelings about this, their thoughts about it. And then we'll stop and we'll have a, a short break for you to um, fill up your glasses and hopefully for us to fill up ours. And then the rest of the time will be over to you. So it's going to be conversation, questions, and I'll say a bit more about that when we get to it. But I'm hoping that as you're listening, you'll be thinking of what you want to know and what you want to say so we can really get some good discussion going. So uh, without further ado then, I'll introduce the first of our panellists, and that's Dr. Michael Bravo. Um, he, he's been quite heroic today. He ended up spending this morning in, in bed feeling terrible, but managed to drag himself out on his, on his knees and elbows to be with us tonight. So thanks very much for that, Michael. Senior lecturer in, in geography and is an associate of the Scott Polar Research Institute at the University of Cambridge. And over to you, Michael. <coughs> Thank you very much. Is that uh, good? Yeah. That's perfect. Yeah, I really did want to be here this evening, so I'm glad that they perked up a bit in the afternoon. It's a fascinating topic. Um, and exploration seems to me an interesting and kind of uh, unlikely or difficult uh, topic to, uh, to feel heroic about today. But even uh, last week, actually, friends of mine in Norway pitched to me, said, well, what do you think about sailing the Northwest Passage next year using the skis and a sail? Something in the pit of my stomach made me realize that this kind of zest for exploration and that kind of little bit of fear uh, haven't entirely disappeared. So I thought it would be worth saying something about kind of the history of exploration and uh, its rather checkered career. Uh, so I, my, my view of exploration is it's rather like a phoenix, uh, which can rise from the ashes. Um, and that is just when you think it's uh, dead and buried, it seems to come back to life in one guise or another. And I think that's where we find ourselves uh, today. So why is that? Well, on the w one hand, uh, there might be a kind of general we might talk about the human passion, I think, still for basic curiosity and for, uh, for discovering things that are new. Um, so there's something about the human spirit. And I think that's, um, I think it speaks to a kind of a desire that's both to discover the outer world, beyond the horizon, but also in some sense to look inwards. 
And it's the relationship between the two, the inner and the beyond, the outer, which I think is truly fascinating and itself is kind of beyond, feels beyond reach. Um, and it's true that uh, it's not, uh, I know we do tend to think of exploration as um, sometimes it's just about dead uh, white men, uh, but I suspect tonight we're going to try and persuade you otherwise, uh, that there's a lot more to it than that. And it's true that for a number of cultures around the world, it's not just uh, European cultures, exploration and uh, what I call the liminal, the edge of civilization, whichever one we're thinking of, has been tremendously important. And a good example would be the, um, uh, the, the Temple of Apollo in ancient Greece at Delphi. So according to uh, the mythology, uh, the, the Temple of Apollo was created by a kind of mythical group of people called Hyperboreans. Uh, living at the very, very edge of the world in the north. And uh, so it's intriguing that in a sense that something is close to home, as central to how we understand who we are and where we are from, uh, seems to somehow require the involvement of something at the very edge of our consciousness and knowledge. Um, well then, the, let me just say a little bit about how exploration seemed to have uh, ended in two senses. One is the, the uh, proponents of exploration have often uh, found it useful to say exploration is nearly finished. All we need is to fund this particular project and then some, our knowledge of something like the globe or some kinds of particles will be complete. And of course that's a good way to pitch a project. Um, but in, an, in another sense also, um, I think around the end of the 19th century and the early 20th century with polar exploration, there did seem to be a, a moment in which one could think that exploration was over when the poles had been conquered, when it seemed that there were no terrestrial um, unknowns to be located. And, and of course, history shows us that that perception, if it was uh, seemed true at the time, certainly isn't because there are constantly new kinds of places in the depths of the oceans and space um, that haven't been uh, studied and understood. Um, but also, crucially, I guess, one of the things that signaled the end of the long 19th century, a period of empire and exploration, uh, in which European nations in particular were, were rushing to colonize the polar regions, uh, was the First World War. I mean, the First World War brought the end of, uh, at least of that phase of empire, and in wiping out really so much life, um, something really changed. And I think um, certainly that period of, of empire um, reminds us tonight that exploration and geopolitics have a really long history. Uh, we could go back to Alexander the Great, um, and many others. So they are, they've, they've, they've all, all, well, have to, they're the always, it's tricky. Have they always been intertwined? That's a, uh, is it of necessity that exploration requires the backing of the state or of a powerful trading company like the East India Company uh, to, um, to advance into, to, into new spaces? Well, um, so geopolitics seems to be with us um, wherever we go, and of course that's not to say that science necessarily needs to be uh, captured or captive to it. I don't think I believe that. I think, as, uh, I think one of the most important things when I was starting my professional career as an engineer was to try and understand where the opportunities were and what kinds of, <clears throat> what kinds of uh, patrons might be, uh, I might be working for. But I don't want to say that uh, whatever kinds of uh, curiosity we exercise, that that necessarily means that you uh, work for the state. But there's no doubt if we look at extreme environments, particularly after the Second World War again, uh, because of the Cold War, so much science was carried out in that context. Um, so um, it was also the period, I suppose, interestingly, of big science. The birth of a lot of big science was post-war because the creation of new medicines like uh, penicillin, although it required a certain kind of genius, and there's the story of uh, Howard Florey in the laboratory. It's also a story of the industrialization of science, of the creation of industrial-scale laboratories. 
So if, if post-war we've moved into a world where so much science is uh, teamwork and is on an industrial scale, that begs the question too, doesn't it, whether exploration in some sense, uh, it doesn't sound right to say it's, it can be done industrially. Uh, and yet it does kind of beg the question, uh, particularly because some of the science which is, uh, from which we get most benefit and understanding today has to be done by large institutions. And it's great that I've got colleagues here who actually do that and, and can tell us much more about it. Okay. Two more points. One is that, um, you know, is exploration back with us today? And is it being democratized? So on the one hand, through tourism and through, uh, through the price of exploration coming down in many regions, you might say it is. So my colleagues who wanted to sail the Northwest Passage said uh, one of the advantages of doing it next year is it's quite a cheap place to do a, 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 an expedition like that. Um, but also, uh, I think one has to say that participation in science um, and also you know, extreme expeditions and travel, now I think a lot of the, the barriers of, of race, of class, of gender that have certainly existed in the past um, are coming down. And uh, I'm sure there's much uh, we've got further to go. Um, particularly the involvement of women in scientific research and in, uh, in extreme regions would be one example. But then I guess you could also uh, ask about uh, human agency. I mean, how much do we need human beings for exploration? After all, quite a lot of the, there's a lot of discussion at the moment, isn't there, about the use of uh, UAVs or drones. And uh, for quite a long time, a lot of scientific research in, in extreme environments has, uh, you know, it's been a great advantage. Commander Hadfield was telling us uh, in his recent book, the advantage of not having to send people into, uh, to carry out research. It saves lives, it's cheaper, it's often in some situations done better. So perhaps the heroic exploration of the future is exploration without humans. And yet, <laughs> There's that and yet, and uh, I think all the panel feel there's still the case for the uh, central involvement of humans, either because the notion of the unmanned, uh, the UAV, in a sense, is an illusion, because behind every kind of uh, instrument like that, there are always teams of human beings designing, making, controlling them, and so on, uh, and therefore there's an ethics behind those. Um, but also, I guess, coming back to the first point I made, that there's something about the spirit of humanity and the inner self. And even if you're one of those people like me who's kind of skeptical, I'm really skeptical about the idea of there being a kind of a human self, an, an inner self that we all share. I'm not so sure that's true. And yet I am willing to go along with the fact that there is kind of a collective interest or a collective desire that uh, is shared across peoples and cultures to understand the world we live in, especially, you know, while we need to take care of it. Thanks very much, Michael. And uh, I should just, just mention, by the way, that when I'm tapping away on my phone, <coughs> I'm not actually doing my email or texting or even tweeting. This is me taking notes. Um, I think um, some really interesting questions that came out of that that I hope we might be able to come back to. Is it inevitable that exploration requires geopolitics? Does there always need to be a state or private sponsor? And uh, what about industrial scale exploration? Is that really exploration? Is it inherently human to explore? I mean, you, you talked about going back to Apollo. Or, you know, I'm thinking the Fertile Crescent. Mm. Or, you know, none of us would be here if we hadn't explored our, our way out of Africa in the first place. So to what extent is this a fundamental human characteristic? Is exploration being democratized by the process of, uh, in, in some ways, partly uh, associating uh, exploration with research? <coughs> Uh, our barriers of race and class and gender coming down. And then this, um, how much do we need humans for exploration? And the heroic future of exploration, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with the notion of a heroic robot, but, um, but maybe we'll talk a bit more about that later. Yeah. So, um, so our next speaker is Professor Jane Francis, and, and this is a, a subject that's especially close to my heart, um, because uh, my, probably the, the place that I love most on Earth is Antarctica, and this is something that Jane knows very much about. She's a director of the British Antarctic Survey and has also had a very illustrious career as a paleoclimatologist working in both the Arctic and the Antarctic. Jane. Thank you very much. 
I'm going to talk to you really about Antarctica, which I do think is sort of, um, you know, one of the places left on Earth where we really, really don't know everything about Antarctica. And there is still a lot of exploring to do, particularly for scientists. And you'll often hear <coughs> Antarctica being described as the coldest, windiest, highest, driest mm -hmm. continent. It really is a challenge to work there. It's remote, it's cold, it's difficult, mm -hmm. it's expensive to get there. But it is absolutely exciting to work there. It's exciting to work there as a scientist. And we really can do new scientific, uh, find new scientific discoveries there by, uh, by really exploring what's in the, in the continent. And I think you could say, well, why do, we, why do we, especially in the UK, why is there a British Antarctic Survey? Why do we need to go all the way to Antarctica to study science? What's there? Why is it important? Well, Antarctica is like a big refrigerator at the bottom of the Earth. I mean, there's a big block of ice on the bottom of the Earth that's up to four kilometers thick. And it affects every one of us sitting here today, even in the UK. So that big block of ice, uh, it influences ocean currents. So the cold water that comes off Antarctica flows all the way to the bottom of the ocean and it comes all the way across the equator into the northern hemisphere. The, the climates of Antarctica affect our atmosphere, even in the UK. And also, excuse me, most importantly, I think the ice that's trapped in Antarctica, about was it 70% of the world's fresh water is, is trapped there. At the moment, the glaciers are melting and they are the cause, or going to be the cause, of major sea level rises around the whole globe. And that the change that's going on in our climate at the moment, caused by more CO2, but there are uh, that link is then causing changes in Antarctica which will affect us in the UK. So it, it is important globally, Antarctica has a role to play, in, uh, a role to play globally. I'm a, a geologist by training and I've uh, worked on uh, particularly fossil plants. So I've been to Antarctica about 10 times now um, to study rocks and fossils and try and understand what Antarctica was like in the past. So to go to Antarctica for me uh, is to go to Antarctica, or it used to be when, when I was allowed to do science, to go to Antarctica for about two months at a time, to go out in a field camp. We lived in tents, not in a warm uh, base, uh, live in tents during the Antarctic summer, and just focus there. And I, I loved being remote because it was away from email, away from phones, away from the rest of the world. And I, I was trapped in my little world of rocks and fossils, and it was fantastic. And the only thing I thought about, thought about the rocks and the, and the fossils and the work I had to do, uh, we thought about the weather, because the weather's really, really critical that you know what's coming up for survival. And then perhaps the most important thing was what you're going to have for dinner, because food became all important in this world that actually is, is, uh, limits your senses. There's not much color or smell or music or sound there. Um, it's quite black. Um, blue and white and a bit of brown. So yeah, food was all important. But we would spend two months there and I particularly found rocks and fossils of plants, of leaves, of pollen, of big trees that used to live in Antarctica millions of years ago when the Antarctic continent was situated over the South Pole. But the climate, global climate was much warmer, more carbon dioxide from volcanoes and dinosaurs and forests covered the South Pole. And by studying those, my research groups, postdocs and um, postgrads, we were able to reconstruct what life was like in Antarctica millions of years ago, 100 million years ago, 70 million years ago, 50 million years ago, which is not too long, geolog <laughs> geologically speaking, until the ice set in in Antarctica about 40 million years ago, and then the glaciers started to cover the continent. So we, we were reconstructing, re reconstructing what was like in the past. So it was discovery and exploration of a kind, if you like, but it was definitely looking at Antarctica today to explore what it was like in the past. The big science, I think, that goes on in Antarctica now, really, one of, some of the big questions are how Antarctica is changing today with climate change and how is that influencing the rest of the world. And I think the biggest projects that are happening in Antarctica are looking at the big glaciers. There's some big glacial systems and ice is draining off the continent in big glaciers and then and floating out as ice shelves on, on the margins of Antarctica. And what's happening is that the oceans around the world are warming up and those, those, those warm seas are getting underneath those ice shelves at the edge of the continent and they're melting them from below. And when the ice shelves are breaking up, I'm sure you've seen on the news uh, some movies in, in the last few years of ice shelves breaking up, 
what happens is those shelves which are on the edge act as a kind of buttress and keep the glaciers back in Antarctica. And when those shelves break off, the glaciers move faster down to the coast. And so gradually the ice is moving from the centre of Antarctica to the edges. And, and scientists, British Antarctic Survey and, and, and all our colleagues all around the UK and in the rest of the world are going to really remote places in Antarctica to try and understand how Antarctic ice is responding to, to global warming. And every time another bit of ice breaks off and, and melts, in, uh, uh, the sea levels are going up bit by bit, uh, 0.3 of a millimetre now, but the predictions are that in, the, you know, in a few years' time we could be melting one of the big ice sheets in Antarctica and releasing about two to five metres of sea level rise in, 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 uh, in, around the world. And the prediction is about a meter per, mil, uh, per 100 years and keep adding on and adding on to that. So we're, we're studying really the glaciers. It's a big challenge now to try and study some of the big glaciers in Antarctica. In, it's quite remote, quite a, in quite remote regions. And the big question, of course, is what's underneath the ice? That's a big, if you like, the big question, a really exciting scientific question, but it's just about discovery. What's underneath the ice? When we take the ice off Antarctica, what will we find? New rock sequences, new fossils? Will we find things in the lakes below the ice that have lived there, isolated for millions of years? There's lots of really exciting science still to do in Antarctica. And Antarctica is very special. It's quite unique in that it's described often as a continent for science. It's the only place on Earth where there has been no war. It's a place where um, nations work together for science. There's a treaty that, that all the nations who work there have signed to agree uh, to abide by the rules. Uh, many of them are environmental rules that prevent as, uh, pollution and contamination as much as possible of the Antarctic um, environment. And so there's uh, no military activity there, no wars, no nuclear activity and it really is preserved for science so it's quite unique in a way and and when we go down there to work we have to go we have to go with permits we have to be very careful about our waste we have to be very careful about contaminating any of the, the environments in Antarctica so it is extreme it is remote it's expensive to get there it's very adventurous it's really wildly exciting but what would happen if we didn't know that Antarctica existed. And I think if you think back, you know, we haven't known about Antarctica for very long, 100 years or so, and yet it forms a really integral part of the Earth system, the climate system, the global system. And if we hadn't discovered Antarctica, you absolutely can be sure that we wouldn't understand how the rest of our systems work that affect us here. So we wouldn't be able to, to run climate models that predict what our weather here is going to be you know, in the next few years. We wouldn't understand how ocean currents circulate. We wouldn't, or why they go like they are. We wouldn't understand why some of the, even the tectonic plates moved around if we didn't know Antarctica existed. And yet there's still so much of Antarctica that we don't know about. So I think it's absolutely a brilliant place to continuing exploring. It's extreme, it's exciting. And I hope we can carry on working there for science for many more years to come. Thank Thanks you. very much, Jane. Um, I, I love the wistfulness with which you said when I was allowed to do science. <laughs> <laughs> and I also recognise that, that message about you spend so much time thinking about your dinner. Whenever I was visiting a remote field camp, it, it, you, can take, you don't take money, you take fresh bread and you take vegetables and then they love you and they'll welcome you in. It's, it's fresh bread as the currency in Antarctica, uh, certainly where I was going. Um, and some lovely thoughts in there as well. Um, that, that message that the two to five metres of sea level rise, and that's not the whole of Antarctica, that's just the, the portion that seems the most vulnerable to melting right now. If you think about the Atlantic, North Atlantic, South Atlantic, the Arctic Ocean, if you think about the Indian Ocean, if you think about the Southern Oceans, if you think about the whole of the Pacific, which covers more than two thirds, is it about two thirds of the Earth? You think about every single square centimetre of that ocean rising by five metres. And that's still only a small proportion of the amount of ice that is in Antarctica. So I think it's, it's a beautiful way that you described the connection between Antarctica and the rest, and the fact that if we didn't know it was there, it would still be influencing us. And so that's one argument about why we should do research in, in remote places, because they do affect us as a, as a kind of the heroic journey 
the hero goes to the farthest off place to find out something about home. And that's one of the things that I find captivating about Antarctica too. Um, also, the model of cooperation that you have there, which is something in, in doing big science in remote and difficult places, you can't do it on your own. You have to collaborate, and you often have to collaborate among different countries as well. And since we're going to have to collaborate for many other reasons, if we're going to solve the big problems that we're facing as a human race, then, then that's another potential reason. Um, and then the last thing about we only discovered Antarctica recently. I love this, that Antarctica is the only, only continent on Earth where we know the name of the first person to be born there. You can't say that about any other continent. That's how recently we met it, and yet it still has that significance. So those are all lovely points, and I hope we can come back to them again soon. So uh, thanks, Jane. Um, uh, our final speaker is uh, Kevin Fong, and uh, he's a consultant anaesthetist at UCL Hospitals. He's an expert in, in uh, the physiology of extreme environments and space medicine. Um, he's probably uh, too um, polite to mention it, but he's also written a very good book about this. Called It's called Extreme. Is that? Extremes, about this? yeah. Extremes, about these topics. So rush out and buy it and tell all your friends as soon as you finish. Um, um, and Kevin, over to you. Uh, thank you. So, so I come at this from a slightly different perspective. I am a doctor of medicine. Uh, I work up the road at University College Hospital. I specialize in anesthesia and intensive care medicine. So it's a different kind of extremes, the, ex the ex extremes of survivability in the face of critical illness and injury. I've recently spent my time working for one of the air ambulance services, so Kent, Surrey, Sussex, um, flying around and trying to push that limit of survivability of injury with the edge of all that science, technology, and engineering have to offer you. Um, for me, that is a sort of exploration. Uh, and I guess what I wanted to talk about was whether we should continue to explore, whether we're at an epoch, whether we're at the, at the end of an era, whether this is a time where if we continue to explore whether humans have a central role in that. And I say that because I'm a huge proponent of human space exploration. I think that's what delivered me to science when I was growing up. That's the first memories I have is watching the tail end of the Apollo project in 1975 or something. The first thing I remember, um, uh, the Apollo Soyuz test project. Um, and I th have this sense that that's what drove me to science as a career later on. And, um, and, I, and I sort of went over from one discipline to another in this sort of you know, voyage of self-exploration, if you like. I, I studied astrophysics, first of all, uh, at UCL uh, for no other real reason other than I thought I wanted to be an astronaut and the university handbook is alphabetically arranged. <laughs> you, know, you go to the first relevant course. Oh, that's true. Uh, and and I, I, I didn't at that time think I was going to study medicine, and partly because my sixth form teachers had sort of said, I don't think anyone will have you at medical school. Uh, uh, and they, they, well, that wasn't unfair of them. I was much more interested in the red haired girl I sat next to than I was the maths lesson. But as I got to university, um, I became more interested in looking in and less interested in looking out, I guess, for a little while. And certainly in my second year of physics, I remember sitting in my flat, and I lived with some medical students, and at one point looking across at them after a particularly heavy night out, thinking, medicine can only be so hard to study, surely. And, and so, so then I decided to study medicine. So I went and studied medicine, and I was very lucky at the end of that medical degree, having thought I was going to put esoteric stuff aside <coughs> and space expression aside, I got to work with NASA and their medical operations group in my final year, and suddenly it sort of lit the... Um, torch for me again, I think, and I suddenly was back into exploration. So I got to the end of all my studies with this sort of double identity. So, you know, I would work as a junior doctor and I would stand specialising in intensive care on a unit at night, looking at my patients, um, trying to do these things. And then I would very, sometimes very literally go home, get on a plane, and go across the Atlantic and sit in a room and talk about how we needed $600 billion to go to Mars uh, when last night I couldn't afford an extra dialysis machine for one of my patients. And so I had that sort of guilt about, well, can you really justify this far-reaching esoteric exploration feat when actually you've got such urgent needs? 
And I spent a long time, the whole of my junior training, really wrestling with that and running that double life and trying to reconcile the two. And, and, and in the end, and that was mostly on the process of, of writing a book about it, was trying to resolve that, that uh, conflict for me. But let me tell you about what I think has happened over, over the last century. I do think that we have arrived at a unique time uh, and a time that is unlike any other time that's gone before it, because the last hundred years have been so fast. And when I was thinking about why we explore and how we explore, you know, we've talked a lot about Antarctica today and, 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 uh, and some of the great naval explorations and the polar regions, and, and we've talked a little bit, hinted about how recent all of that is, but it is horribly recent, you know. We have only just celebrated the centenary of the first human footprints at the South Pole in 1912. You know, 2012, that's 100 years, that's 10 decades, that's within the life expectancy of a child born in this country today with only slightly better than average luck. Um, in 1897, uh, there's a map uh, I've got when, uh, that's got a map of the world, and at the bottom of the map, it's got this lovely sort of strip of indefinite coastline that says the supposed continent of Antarctica. You know, this is, this is just over 100 years ago. And at the same time, the textbooks of surgery that we had said you shouldn't operate on the human heart. You can't operate on it. It's an inviolate hole. It, only a maverick would do so. So this is 10 decades ago, OK? And now we sit here and we talk about... You can go down... We were talking just before this about how you can go down for basically, you know, a long weekend to Antarctica. Uh, and and there will be people in the audience who will have had heart procedures and certainly people in the audience, if not, who know people who have had heart operations, and it's a deal, but it's not massive, big, oh, can't be done deal. The last 10 decades have seen us advance in exploration in a way that I don't think we've ever seen in any period in human history, to be honest with you. And I say that because if Ferdinand Magellan, when he sailed around the world, or at least his crew saved, sailed around the world uh, between 1518 and 1521, looked at Scott's ship, the Terra Nova, in 1912, they would have said that is a ship of discovery. If you show Ferdinand Magellan, Armstrong and Aldrin's ship of discovery, uh, the Apollo, uh, uh, the Saturn V with the Apollo capsule on top of it, he would have said, what the hell is that? Uh, and, and he wouldn't really have understood it as a ship of discovery. And yet 50 years will just about separate Terra Nova and uh, Saturn V. Mm -hmm. We talk about the heroic feats of exploration. So Scott uh, and his team heroically plodding to the South Pole and failing to plod back. That heroic period, although we'd say it ended with World War I and the understanding of the idiocy of that sort of colonial heroism, actually, the conquest of Everest still looks like that, doesn't it? It's still men putting one foot bravely in front of another foot until they get to where they want to go without dying. That's 53. That's one of the last terrestrial poles we achieve. And then look at 61 with Gagarin and 69 <coughs> with Armstrong and Aldrin. Look at how different those feats of exploration are separated by a decade. And by the way, in 68, Barnard also does the first human heart transplant, having gone from the start of that century from a position where all the textbooks said, don't do that, don't touch that, don't do it, to the point at which you're taking a heart out of someone who's recently died, putting it in the body of someone who is about to die and getting at least one survivor out of that. That is how far we came in a short period of time, and we moved on. So over the 20th century, we went from an exploration where we didn't really understand the body particularly well. We didn't understand, didn't understand the secret with which we <coughs> transmitted our likeness and our traits from generation to generation. We didn't understand DNA, that, that uh, molecular theory of, of, uh, of inheritance. We didn't understand the South Pole. We hadn't been there. We hadn't gone across our own planet, let alone into the endless skies. And yet, in the 10 decades that followed, we did all of that and more, and we went into space. And by the 1960s, we were planning missions that would go to Mars. Now, we got to about the 1960s, and we were hugely optimistic. And if you look at the mission architectures at that time, and I spent a lot of time when I was at NASA looking at them, there are architectures which bravely say, well, we've been to the moon, and we did that inside of Kennedy's decade. So therefore, Mars is going to be twice as far away. So it's 20 years. So we'll be, they, there, are, there are viable mission architectures written for the mid-1980s to Mars. We were so optimistic. We were so sure of ourselves. The pace of advance was so fast. Uh, and Mars was 20 years away, and it always is, and it always has been. And every mission architecture we write is 20 years into the future. 
And now we sit now where the people who talk about human space exploration, this, this the final frontier, the hawkish people talk about it as this waste of money that has literally seen us going around in circles for the last 50 years. Um, and something of limited value which has no place in the 21st century. And you have to ask yourself whether or not that might be true. Certainly, Mars is still 20 years in the future, and it's going to cost us a lot of money, and we do an awful lot with automated platforms. Now, do we continue? And that's very difficult to know. Yes, there are lots of things to do here. Um, yes, I think that there are... Um, lots of priorities that we need to try and address. In the end, I think when I finished writing the book, I, I wasn't sure that, well, that's not true. I was sure that it was a false dichotomy, that I think that the things that we say of, you know, exploration in terms of being a waste of money, look, if, if you stopped exploring physical exploration, then I thought that you would then suddenly have the best health service and, uh, uh, and no world poverty and no famine then I'd be out there marching against it. I just don't think that's true. I just don't think that's how it works. But more than that, I think that science and exploration is what we've all, well, exploration is what we've always done. And I think the final thing I would say is this, in my conclusion, my thoughts about exploration is this. My very good friend, Richard Barnett, who is much cleverer than I am and much well versed in the history of exploration, told me off when I was sort of being quite romantic about exploration when he said, listen, Exploration isn't something that all cultures have always done. There are cultures who've never explored. And besides, what history tells about exploration is some of the cultures who were explored did pretty badly out of that deal. Um, you know, the conquistadors going in uh, to some of the, some of the South American uh, indigenous tribes, uh, for example. And so he told me off for being romantic about it, and he, he was right to do so. So you have to think about it. Exploration, like technology and science, is neutral. Um, and it is what you do it and how you do it, what, what you do with it and how you do it that defines what it is. But, but this idea that in science, and by extension I think our technology and the technology upon which our economies are based, that you can predict what's going to happen, that you know what you need to do to get to the future, I think is wrong, manifestly wrong. I think when you look at the past, you know that all we've done is fight the battles of the time that we were in, and somehow that got us onto the next bit, and the next bit, and the next bit. And so I think my conclusion of my thoughts about exploration ultimately were that it is true, and it's obviously true, that to continue to explore as a species, you must survive. That's absolutely true. But I think, and increasingly I think, that the reverse is also true, that as a species, to survive, you must explore. And I. I think you can hold that argument up in many, many ways. That's what I had to say. <laughs> Thanks very much, Kevin. Uh, wow, that was a great quote, to explore you must survive, but as a species to survive you must explore. But maybe at the end we can go back to that and see if we still think there's some merit in it. I, I think um, I, I picked out, there's a lot of richness in that, as with the other talks too, and I just picked out a few things to perhaps reflect on. This, this, this argument is this an end of an era, how we've been accelerating and exploring and now human exploration is something of the past. We don't really need to do that anymore particularly and we're, we're getting increasingly technological about that. And yet the flip side of that is, you know, I was inspired by the tail end of Apollo as well and, and, and uh, I, I mentioned earlier that uh, if you see a satellite going overhead, it's quite cool. But if you see a satellite and realise it's a space station and there are people in it, that changes everything about the way you feel about it and how much will that continue to be true. Can you justify big budget exploration? And you can't afford a dialysis machine, but is there just one pot of money? And if you don't spend it on this, will you actually spend it on that? Um, what about research and technology as exploration in itself? Heart surgery, understanding the body, searching for the Higgs boson, are they actually exploration in extreme environments? It's hard to imagine what's more extreme than, a, than open heart surgery or indeed the Large Hadron Collider. Um, and we didn't go to Mars and it's still 20 years away. I might challenge that. I'd say China say they're going to go to Mars, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet against it. And I say India just sent a probe to, to um, Mars themselves, and China say they're going to go to the moon first. And uh, there's, there's a prestige associated with that, and we also need to be careful not to be too, too uh, Anglo-Saxon about this when we're saying, is exploration dead, or where might exploration come from? Um, 
exploration like technology and science is neutral. I might challenge that a little bit as well. Because if it's true that exploration necessarily takes some kind of sponsorship, that it's a state or that is the geopolitics involved or is there some key rich player, is there some company, then it's always going to have some edge associated with it. It isn't just necessarily pure. Or is it? And especially, you can't predict what will happen in anything. And that's one of the things that makes exploration so, so very exciting. So I've just picked out those thoughts. There are many others there, and you'll have your own too. So now we have an opportunity to stop, recharge our glasses, and in about uh, a few minutes, five or six minutes, we'll come and sit back down again. And that's your chance to help us with questions. So thanks very much. Here we are, ready to hear your questions and your thoughts. So for this part of the, of the evening now, there will be some roving microphones. And uh, please let the microphone come to you so that everybody can hear what you're saying. And because this evening is also being recorded, uh, please say who you are. And do try to keep your comments uh, as brief as you can so that we can make this as much of a conversation as possible. And uh, with that, here we go. Who wants to start? Have we stunned you all? Okay, yes. Is the role of testosterone in exploration and research changing? So, is the question, the question, is the role of testosterone changing? Mm. The early it, explorers were men, yes, they were. driven by oh, right. the need to conquer. So, so, so how important is, is testosterone in exploration and research? And is it becoming less important or is it changing in some way? Excellent question. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll, I'll start. Why don't you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So there are about, I think, um, the number of, uh, of females working at BAS is about 27%, which is pretty good, actually. In the British, in the British Antarctic Survey, women didn't start going to Antarctica until about uh, 1991, actually, which is a bit late, because it was the 70s in other uh, polar organisations overseas. But, but in fact, now, I think it's that, that kind of number is fairly normal for a science organisation generally, and the women go to Antarctica just like any other... <laughs> any other man <laughs> and uh, and do the same thing so they you know, get grant they get grants they do their work they come up with the projects and I don't think there's any difference the only difference there is actually is that until I got to Bass a year ago they always insisted on buying men's clothes and women had to wear men's underwear and if there's one thing <laughs> I've changed in the British Antarctic Survey is that the person who orders the clothes now buys women's thermal underwear. Hey. <laughs> because someone had to wear that, I'm very happy to hear it, Jane, well done. Other comments? Just taking it from a slightly different vantage point, I, mean, I suppose testosterone is also it's about the physiology of adolescence um, and what changes boys' behaviour. Um, so one of the really important things to think about in relationship to exploration is, is reading. And uh, we were saying in the, inter in the interval, as long as young people are reading things like ladybird books or many other forms of, of uh, writing about exploration, then exploration will stay alive. And it's quite interesting. I'm a historian, essentially. And, and the history of travel writing, of, of scientific travel, is, you know, probably one of the strongest genres of writing in history. In the 18th century, more people read travel writing than novels, and the audience was as much women as men. Perhaps what's changed today now is that you know, women are more involved in all aspects of travel as well as writing. Kevin, I was just thinking that one of the big arguments that was used for women not to go to Antarctica was that they wouldn't be able to survive there as effectively as men. And my understanding is it's the exact opposite, isn't oh, it? Yeah. Is it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I, you know, I, I think, I think actually, again, your your question comes really back to a, that that whole theme of how fast things are progressing. The reason the history looks like uh, determined testosterone-driven white men with beards marching everywhere is is because that's where we have been politically and socially until recently. You know, I was talking to someone the other day about Star Trek, you know, its first episode transmit just half a century ago now. And you look at it now and you think, well, why wouldn't you have a multicultural crew and why wouldn't one of the senior office be a black woman on that? But actually, in the 1960s, when it's transmitting for the first time, you're like, what the hell is this? What, what warship would have, or what spaceship would have that as its crew? You know, they, 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 they were trying really hard to break this mold of this is not how we explore. And that, it's, it's that expression, even then, you know, 
their, their tokenism about both race and gender and, and, and sex and that are still, still pretty non-progressive when you look at it now. So I think that what you're talking about is the fact that, that you know, in some ways how politics and socially we, we have moved quickly, possibly haven't moved as quickly as some of the technologies. I think I'd like to comment as well that, um, uh, you know, the, the first women who went to the South Pole, for the, for the first men who went to the South Pole, there's this bitter battle, there's this race. Is it going to be the Norwegians? Is it going to be the British? We all know what happened. And then it was considerably later, what, 50 years later or more, that the first women went to the South Pole. And they were actually uh, taken there on an airplane, as sort of a stunt. And there were six of them. So the question was, which would be the first woman of those six to set foot on the South Pole? And do you know what they did? Does anyone know what they did? Shared it. They held hands and all yeah. worked up together. So the, 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 there were six simultaneous first women to stand on the, on the South Pole. And I mention that partly because uh, you, you, you said, how is testosterone changing this? But I, I suspect that testosterone has actually played less of a role in exploration per se mm. than we might think. Um, and I, I have two reasons to say this. And one of them is that when I went to the South Pole uh, for the second time, I met the guy who was the king of the South Pole. He'd spent five successive winters there. No one's ever done that before or since. Five winters in a row at the South Pole. And he worked outside. It was incredibly macho. And, and his clothes were all kind of ripped and shredded, and he kind of marched around the place, the king of the South Pole. So I was, you know, I knew I was going to have to talk to him, but I was really dreading it. This is going to be Mr. Macho Testosterone. <coughs> and when I finally talked to him, he was the exact opposite. He said, if anyone comes here talking about conquering the South Pole, within a month or two of being in the winter, they're crying for the mummy. <laughs> and he said, this place is not a place to conquer. He described it as patient, and he described it as intimate. That's his experience of being there at the South Pole. And the other thing I'd say is I spoke to a lot of different women who've been down there early on, sort of as the first women in different, you know, the, 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 with the, the British organization, with the Italian, the French, the, the, the US, the Russian. And especially the message that I got was that this was not a battle between men who wanted to keep the South Pole or keep the Antarctica free of women and women who wanted to go there. What people told me again and again and again was the battle was between men and women on the one side and bigots, as they described them, on the other. Because many of the men wanted women there as much as the women wanted to go. So I suspect that we think it's very testosterone charged, but maybe the testosterone was actually as much of a hindrance as a help when it came to the exploration. Next question. Hello. Thanks for um, hosting this event. It's really fascinating. And I speak from somebody who's outside of the science and technology kind of sector. And you, you tell these sort of, sort of fantastic stories, and I just wonder, is sort of science and exploration is seen, it's sort of seen as a bit kind of fringe and a bit sort of, it, it's not high profile. Um, is that something you'd want to change? Would it help if you had more attention in the uh, media and if your stories were more widely known? Because, um, you know, people would enjoy hearing them for one. <laughs> So science in, in, in extreme places is, is not yes. so much known. Yes, yeah, and um, space exploration as well, which is sort of seen as being out of fashion for mm. a number of years. So, so would it help the cause of science in extreme places if, if the, we had more visibility and attention? Well, look, I, you know, that's the way the political world works, that if something has greater visibility and, and the public generally like it, mm. then it tends to stick around, look at Top Gear. And uh, 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 so, 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 yes, no, 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 no but, but you know, elf punk. So, 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 so um, but you know, there's a few things there. One is that there is this trope that we went to the moon and everyone is excited, and then we got progressively less interested, and now no one really cares anymore. And that's not true, although we swallow it whenever it's read out because it's a bit of lazy genius, and they go, well, that must be true because I've heard it said so many times. But if you look at the source data for that, there's some interesting stuff about how popular that was. So, for, so, so if they did, they did um, uh, proper formal polls of the American population up to the, the landing on the moon. And approval for Project Apollo never hit 50% until a few weeks around the landing on the moon, and then it fell off very quickly after that. So basically, this idea that everyone wanted to go to the moon and everyone thought it was a good idea at the time is a lie, at least from the polls that were done at the time. Then this idea that actually the public lost interest. Well, when you look at the number of technical PhDs that, 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 that uh, 
are gained by students in the United States in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in the post-Apollo period, they just massively upswing and they track exactly the Apollo budget. So as the, uh, so as the space budget goes up, so does the number of people taking those, those degrees. And then as that budget falls off, then there's a lag and then the number of those uh, degrees falls off. So basically, government blinked first and it blinked first because it's very expensive. Then when you look through shuttle periods, when you look at American approval for shuttle, it climbs during the years, it gets higher after the tragedies, but it sits at around the mid-60% approvals. So basically, I think there's a massive appetite for this. It's not good for governments because these, these programs are expensive. And, and it's easier to say no one's bothered and everyone's quite bored of it. But actually, the truth is, and I think your brain kind of rejects that, you know, if you look around you. If you do straw polls, random polls of the public, about 55 to 60% of people think human space exploration is great, and about 45% of people think it's dreadful and we shouldn't be doing it, it's a waste of money, and people don't sway very much. <laughs> I guess hey. it also depends where you are and who you ask. Uh, having just come back from Norway, I was reading an interview with Mr. Mr. Ulvang, one of their uh, triple, triple skiing gold medalists, and I think currently president of the World Ski Federation. And uh, in the interview, he was, uh, he was in the USA explaining the passion for skiing, cross-country skiing, because the Americans seemed quite puzzled. And he said, well, it's a little bit like football in the USA, except we have higher, higher ratings. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> in some places, this is, is, um, carries everybody. I wanted to build upon the first question about testosterone-driven uh, heroic exploration with a question for Professor Francis. I think that... Um, the idea that especially polar exploration has always been driven by testosterone is, is really a myth. There were women applying to go on Scott and Shackleton's first expeditions. And I wonder now that those um, structural aspects of, of women's exclusion are, are gone from polar exploration, what do you find that there is an increasing number of women who are interested in, uh, in field work in these extreme environments or whether Bass has to um, look into any sort of active recruitment policies to encourage more women? No, no, I don't think we do. I mean, actually, at the, at the moment, we are uh, preparing a proposal for Athena Swan. I don't know if you know about that. That's a Royal Society scheme for women in science. And so to, to, make a, to get a bronze medal, you have to put together lots of data. And I think that what, what it shows at Bass is that we're like any other academic institution, like a university, we have the same profile there. And I think we have as many applications from women as we do from, for men from different things. And we, interestingly, we have the same percentage of women, say, if you go to any university department, you'll find that women are attracted more to biology and less to physics and maths, and it's exactly the same in, in Bass. So I don't think there's, there's really much difference at all. I think, um, I was just trying to think if there is any, any specific thing. I mean, there are some... Of course, going to Antarctica is really difficult. You, you have to go for a long time. You have to leave your families behind. But then if you work for National Oceanography Centre, you have to go on a ship and you go away. If you work for any other scientific organisation where you have to go away to do field work, if you're a mother, you know, you, you tend to go away less, although, of course, it affects fathers as, as well. And so you do need very good parental support to do that kind of thing. But in terms of applications, I don't think we have... There's no noticeable difference. There's certainly no sense of that. I mean, we follow all the equality and diversity rules, and there's no sense that uh, women are, are uh, disadvantaged or, or men are chosen above women. One, one extra comment I'd make about that is that certainly when I was there tracking it, I'd find that there was, there was still quite a strong cultural element in the different countries, in mm. that the, the proportion of women in the Italian and French organisations was minuscule. Mm. And they expected it to be so. They actually built a new station on the, on the plateau and built uh, uh, five times or six times as many men's loose as the women's. And when I said, why were they doing that? They said, obviously, there's always going to be fewer women here, many fewer women here. As, and, that, and that was sort of built into the system. Mm. Um, and, and then the other uh, point about that is that, uh, by contrast, the American program has about 50-50. Mm. But that's not because they have a higher proportion of women researchers. It's that they have the biggest uh, logistics Program. So, so they have a vast number of people who are down in their very big bases as carpenters, as locksmiths, as, as mechanics, as all of those things. And, and very many of those are women. 
And very many of those did not have those skills when they went to Antarctica. Mm. So they actually, they were chosen for their attitude and then taught how to be a locksmith or a mechanic or whatever when they got there. And so that's why you, you have a, a bigger balance there. Uh, are there. Oh, there's a gentleman over here who had a question. I'd like to ask about um, when people are in distress up a mountain with blinding headaches or in the jungle being bitten by lots of midges or in extreme temperatures in the Arctic having terrible diarrhoea, how much does this affect their ability to think clearly and do the research? Not. <laughs> <laughs> Great question. <laughs> Dane Cohen. Actually, actually, I tell you, one of the hardest places I've worked is Central Australia. I was a postdoc in Australia and I had to work in the deserts of Central Australia. I like deserts, not humidity. I couldn't even begin to work in, in humid places. But in, in the heat of, heat of Central Australia, in a heat wave, I could feel my brain frying and I knew that I couldn't think and that if I sort of didn't concentrate, I would wander off and probably die. In Antarctica, um, the, the cold is quite refreshing, actually, and I think it helps. It helps you concentrate, unless you get really, really cold, and then, of course, you're near hypothermic, and then you do become real, real fuzzy. But um, how does it... Imp when you get extremely hot or extremely cold, I think then if you, be, you become preoccupied by cold fingers. I mean, I've, I've worked in Antarctica where it's so cold that even where you wear three pairs of gloves, if you've got to sort of write with your fingers, you still get cold fingers and you spend all your time like this so you're not writing and things like that. So, and then you're, you concentrate a lot on the cold as opposed to your work. So there is a limit to which you can work in the extreme conditions but you still do because that's why you're there and that's what you want to do. Mm. Uh, actually, the, the same guy who, who said to me that uh, if, you, if you come down here and want to conquer the South Pole uh, after two months, you'd be crying for your mummy. He also said that he, he get very frustrated with the way the disconnect that at the South Pole, you can actually pick up a telephone mm. and you can phone the kind of administrative offices back in the US, in Denver in this case, and have conversations with them about whether you've done a certain piece of work or if you've done a certain amount of support. And he said that... To put it politely, he, this isn't quite how he put it, but he said they don't really understand what it's like down, down here. And he told me that once he said uh, he was having this conversation with this person on the other end of the phone, and he said, can you feel your fingers? Because I haven't felt them in days and put the phone down. <laughs> so maybe that was affecting his, not necessarily his ability to do his work, but maybe his manner with his colleagues. How about that? So, so, I mean, as I said before, to be able to continue to explore, you must in the first place survive. And in these extreme environments, you are pretty close to the edge of it in some of these cases. Um, uh, at the extremes of hot and cold, some of the first symptoms of hypothermia and hypothermia are behavioural disorder. You know, this is why you have some of these situations in which you hear these terrible cases of people who are found in ski resorts wearing no clothing having frozen to death, and it's partly because the onset of hypothermia is accompanied by bizarre behavioural responses. So yes, it does, I mean, it affects everything about you. As far as I can tell from everything I've learned about human factors over the years, your brain doesn't work as well as you think it does, even under normal conditions, and it works <laughs> e even, even less well when you're exposed to the extremes. And then finally to say that at some of the most physical extremes, so if you take altitude as sort of this hypoxic extreme where your body is short of oxygen uh, because there's a lack of partial pressure of oxygen to drive it into your bloodstream. You know, you are wildly deranged. And the guys who climb Everest who I have huge respect for, amongst them some of my colleagues uh, at University College, you know, that's everything that you can do to stick one foot in front of another on the way up the ridge to, to that thing. And there's this wonderful quote that I can't remember precisely by the first guy to climb it without oxygen, when actually scientists said that it wasn't possible. They did the maths. They worked out that you probably couldn't climb it uh, without oxygen. And it's Habler who, who, who says something like, you know, he, he, uh, I think he writes a note at the top of Everest saying, you know, I'm nothing but a free floating lung floating amongst the clouds. And this is the <laughs> expression of a dying brain, a brain that's dying of starvation of oxygen, really. You know, it's nothing else. It's quite clearly someone who's having a massive trip because of hypoxia. <laughs> You know, and similarly, you know, the free divers who say, you know, how they feel very at one with the ocean when they're down there. Well, that's because they very nearly are one with the ocean. <laughs> uh, and so, yes, yes, of course, physical extremes unprotected do impair your ability to perform because it nearly kills you. Dave. Well, Michael's, uh, Michael's going. Okay. 
So I, I think there's another side to it. And so, of course, it begs the question you're asking, what's an extreme environment? Because mm -hmm. clearly, when you really are so close to the edge, then your body may behave very differently. Something I find really interesting about people I know and the time I've spent in, in the Arctic, which isn't terribly cold, is usually, you know, in the winter, minus 35. Uh, maybe in with a bit of a wind, chill of minus 70 or something. Uh, and Tasty. Often, often what, yeah, well, it's, what's, what's often uncomfortable is the darkness combined with those things. Uh, and what strikes me is the people who are really experienced in these environments have the opposite reaction. They find, they find comfort. They feel more comfortable in these environments than they do here, they'll often, they'll often say. And I understand that because one of, the, one, of the, one of the ways you get cold, actually, in any environment is by being anxious and your body's tense. You might tell me what goes on physiologically. But I think uh, exploration, pe people who work in extreme environments often come to talk about feeling at home in them. I, d I do think that's really interesting and it, for, for this evening for one particular reason. If we've heard that in the 20th century, we've, our cultures have often been concerned with, with mastery of nature and of that kind of modernist view of the world where we, we with enough, enough muscle and technology, um, well, we know this is kind of the Anthropocene. The story of the Anthropocene today is we know we need a different story. So in that sense, it really interests me about how people come to feel comfortable in very different environments. It's got to have something to do with a mixture of knowledge, but also learning how to feel connected to, um, mm. to environments that we thought were very different and inhospitable, and realizing in some sense that with care, you know, there are places for us to call home. I think there were some people who, who in Antarctica who I spoke to about their spending the winter there said that they almost felt as if the darkness was like a blanket that they were drawing up around them. And they felt almost <laughs> physical pain when the sun came back because then normal stuff comes back and everybody else is going to be coming and the special thing is over. And I think that's maybe a similar mm -hmm. kind of feeling. Yeah. Jane? Yeah, and following on from that, I think working in those extreme environments, one aspect is the remoteness and the isolation more than the temperature. And in fact, right now, in one of our bases in, in deep and dark Antarctica, where it's really cold and very dark now, we have a, a group of about 15 people in, in, the, in the base with a do the doctor who is um, uh, experimenting on them, if you like. There we have a big project that is funded by a European Space Agency, mm. and they are doing tests on them to see uh, about uh, how they survive isolation and remoteness in readiness for missions to Mars. So Antarctica mm. is, is, is compared to the isolation that people will experience in Mars. And they're sitting in chambers doing um, you know, simulation of space docking, and they're doing um, uh, tests looking at the kind of words they use to, 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 to explain their moods to, so that somebody can under, do a psychological yeah. test to see how they cope with remoteness. Fantastic. Thanks. So there's a question here. Uh, John Whitten, uh, would you like to comment on the relevance of historical data, both physical and human, to today's science and the prosecution of today's science? So how much is historical data, explorers of the past who were doing science in extreme environments, how much do we actually use that in today's science or in today's way of doing science? Well, the thing, I think it's massively relevant in ways that we nev would never have been predicted at the time. And this is what I always come back to whenever you look back at any part of science or history. So, you know, you look back at... Um, Captain Cook sailing around and um, going further south and saying, you know, in, in the mid-1800s, saying, no one will go further <coughs> south than me. So here's this great quote, no man, sh no man shall sp sail further south than I. Uh, and then he backs himself up and says, anyway, effectively, the paraphrasing at the end of it says, anyway, even if they do, it would be completely pointless. The, the land to the south would have no use to uh, anybody. Um, <laughs> and of course he's wrong in both counts. Of course people do go south, uh, men and women. Uh, and and the, the value in that is immeasurable. When Scott and Amundsen uh, and, and their teams went to the South Pole at the start of the 20th century, no one really understood what the value would be in the future. And yet, and if we were sitting here a hundred years ago having this discussion, you would be saying to me, what is the point? What is the point of the South Pole? It's made of snow and rock as far as we can tell. 
I mean, you can't farm there and you can't launch much of an attack from there. What's the point? And yet, by the end of the same century, it would be clear that the paleo atmospheres that you were getting from bubbles of ice cores would be informing us about the future of our planet and literally having knowledge that may help, help us save the planet. So yes, I think historical data, if that's your question, do contribute to our future explorations. But the important thing is to say that they contribute in ways that were never anticipated mm. at the time. Mm. Jane, do you want to comment? No, I totally agree. I think that there are some things, those early observations, I'll talk about it from a geological point of view, were really absolutely critical. I think science is a process of building and building and building on that information. And in fact, I think going, look, there are quite a lot of scientists now who are going back to some of the historical data to um, try and build long-term records or historical records, not geological long-term records, but historical records for hundreds of years because there are quite interesting, I mean, the, the early explorers, wherever they were, in the oceans, fishing, um, whatever they did, some of that early data is, uh, are now being used to compile historical records. So, for example, I know I saw recently a fantastic record of the fish stocks in certain oceans in the north because uh, uh, scientists had gone back through um, um, all the fishing logbooks on certain ships and worked out you know, how much mackerel had been, been caught in the past and that kind of thing. So they are becoming really relevant now for long-term records. There's another long-term record that I'd love to draw attention to, and this is a tribute to the British Antarctic Survey, that there were, there were uh, three men who were kind of working down in, I think, probably the same remote base as the Halley you were talking about, mm. the same remote base in Antarctica, who, among others, they were measuring the weather, they were measuring the temperature, and they were measuring the ozone. And uh, it was quite difficult for them to do this because uh, they were asked, why are you doing that? Well, and they said, well, we don't know what it is and we'd like to know. Uh, there's no point. There's no point in measuring the ozone. That's a ridiculous thing to do. Why are you doing that? But they still kept sending their balloons up anyway. And, uh, and their records showed them that there was a hole in the sky. There was zero ozone right overhead. And they didn't publish it because, um, straight away because NASA had a satellite that was measuring ozone and hadn't found any problems at all. So it was ridiculous for them to be out exploring in this place and continuing to measure it. And there's no need, there's a satellite up there. But they kept measuring and they kept finding the holes. So they felt very worried about this and they published it anyway. And it turned out, you know this story, that uh, the reason that NASA's satellite was not showing a hole was that it had been pre-programmed to, to throw out one. results that were clearly spurious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so stupid machine, it thinks there's no ozone there. It's obviously broken, so we'll fix it again. So, so the, the merit then in having people who were there in this remote place, in the, the location, putting up balloons for no reason, because it was there because they wondered about it, actually brought us to the place where we understood that there was a hole in the ozone layer and, and, and globally we needed to do something about it or, the, or globally we would be in trouble. I think Gabriel's last story raises a really interesting point about, um, we've talked a bit about big funding in the Arctic and NASA getting us in, in the Antarctic and NASA getting us into space. Um, does this big funding in extremes mean that there's no room for science outside of a certain paradigm mm. maybe within extremes and extremes kind of control us in different ways, not just our bodies, but in the way we can think or we're allowed to think in its dreams because we can't get the funding for certain ideas in its dreams. Well, we've got a big field of examples to choose from. It's a great question. But my experience working in Arctic uh, environments, especially field stations, um, you know, it's incredible how much uh, science is done on a shoestring budget. Mm. I'm not sure if you agree, Jane. But, um, mm. It's, in fact, the more I've worked and occasionally come into policy discussions or where I've, where I've worked with the directors of major polar research institutes around the world looking at how international cooperation uh, can be more effectively used, I'm amazed at the opportunities for joined up science that don't, that's, that don't necessarily cost very much at all. So I think one example would be the um, may know that the air currents of the Earth dump a lot of contaminants over the Arctic. They lead to the Arctic. So it's important to monitor uh, about 10 or roughly a dozen different sites around the Arctic. We realized that in northern Canada, I think two of the three sites weren't uh, being monitored, even though it would only cost about $75,000 a station to do that for this kind of big research problem. So, you know, on the one hand, some kinds of problems don't necessarily cost 
large amounts of money. And on the other hand, uh, the ingenuity, particularly of field-based scientists, who I have a soft spot for, people who go out there, you know, constantly bringing friends up to help. You know, if they're making a research station, they'll get and fly a friend up to do the electric. They'll um, save up from other sources, probably their own, put a lot of their own personal funds into, into spending uh, time doing field research. So in the context of extreme environments, I think that um, I think the stories of individuals remain really salient. I think there still are opportunities. Jane, what do you think? So is the space of blue sky research given the constraints for funding? Well, I think you can, uh, in some areas, do individual research. But I think these days, a lot of the big science questions require big grants and going to really extremes. And I think you can do, you can do science on a shoestring but actually, if you look where, if you, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of scientific research has been done on this to really answer the big questions and have really big impact. You have to have the big projects and to do it properly, you have to have proper funding. And that requires the funding agencies and everybody to decide how they're going to, to split their money up. And it's been shown that you can do lots of small things, but you have very small incremental changes. But if you really want a big change with big answers, you need to back a winner and really put your money in to do th something really properly. I think it's also probably true, it is fair to say, that the funding agencies don't just fund what seem to be uh, sort of very specific uh, questions with very specific answers. They're also yeah. prepared to fund things that are more... Uh, blue yeah, sky yeah. and more experimental mm -hmm. and then also oh, yeah. the sorts of people that are prepared to get off the backsides and go out of their comfortable beds and go to these places tend to be very passionate and tend to work every hour god sends and when you've got 24 hours of daylight you can have people who don't get very much sleep when they're in antarctica <laughs> and so we'll find every opportunity while i'm here i'll do this and this and this and mm. so i think there's always the that opportunity for creativity there as well so, so I, I, okay. would, I, would, I would just say that i, I, I do think that the threat that you recognise in that yeah. question is real. Yeah. That I think that the skew oh. towards the things that grab attention, mm. that prevents us from funding the important but the mundane is real and it's a problem of our current state of politics. It is the way it happens in medicine. We fund the hell out of HIV and cancer. It's a very high profile. It's there. Dementia for years. Who cares? It's not, there's not a pressure group there. Mm. Uh, and, and it was five times less funded than... Mm. than, than Answer, uh, and we took a long time to wake up to that. Mm. So, yes, of course, I think you should go after extreme science, but not at the exclusion of the non-extreme science. Ex extreme environments are a tool. The way to use ex extremes of the physical world is to use it to simplify your systems. At least that's what we used to mm. do in physics. But mm. if you look at a system at boundary conditions, sometimes it strips out a lot of the complexity of the system mm. and allows you to reveal properties of the system that otherwise yeah. would remain hidden. Yeah. And I think that you can do that both physically mm. and biologically. But mm. yes, you're right, there is a risk. And there mm. is also the general point about uh, long-term measurements as well mm. Mm. that have, have never been more important and yet are not very sexy. And, and often those long-term measurements, the funding mm. agencies or governments will say, oh, yeah. we don't need to do that anymore. Yeah. And yet we really do. But I think that's changing now. I think people have really begun to realise that long-term long -term data is a really important. And so I think there's more funding going that way now. Yeah. You were talking earlier about inspiration. And I was thinking I was, I was nine years old in 1969 when I was watching Neil Armstrong uh, walk on the moon on a dodgy black and white TV on a cross-channel car ferry as our family made its epic expedition from Glasgow to the south of France. <laughs> and if I couldn't be Neil Armstrong, I at least wanted to be Scott Tracy from Thunderbird 1 <laughs> and all that kind of good stuff. And now, 40 odd years later, I work in aerospace and I'm an engineer and I write software for aircraft design. One of the things that is a bit of a crisis in that world, you talked about the rise in STEM degrees in the States that track NASA funding. It's reckoned that in five years' time, 25% of all American aerospace engineers will have retired. 25% mm. of the entire brain stock Whoa. of American aerospace is off to play golf. And there's nothing to take its place. And uh, I think you can't underestimate inspiration. And I think we ought to get ourselves to Mars, and there'll be a whole mm. bunch of uh, wonderful things will come as a result of that that have got nothing to do with going to Mars. Mm. 
Absolutely. I think we all agree. <laughs> yeah. No, no, but I think that's true. I think if you went around the room for people of a certain age, everyone has their iconic memory. You know, and I remember being on these panels. I worked with British National Space Centre, which later became UK Space Agency, when I was trying to argue for us to re-involve ourselves in human space exploration in this country. And I'd sit opposite people who would row me, you know, fiercely saying, no, 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 no. You get them in the coffee break, you know, do you know what, though? The reason I'm in science is because and then they have a story like that, which I thought, wow. And this was all of them. And, and so, yes, I think that it's underestimated. It's not the only reason, but it is an important reason. Yeah. Hi. Um, so we are space physiology students, these four of us, and we came up with an interesting debate in a class. So uh, we were debating exploration and what it means, but the argument or discussion came up on is the International Space Station exploration, is Antarctica exploration, since these are established bases for many years, are they still considered exploration? So I was wondering the panel's views on that. Great question. Has it become too establishment to be true exploration? So, so you need to, the problem is, right, is that I think that the world changes so fast, you see technology obsolescence so quickly in cycles. So you're black and white fuzzy, I remember that. I remember turning on Doctor Who, and if you didn't get there in time, you had to listen to the bloody titles before the picture came on the screen <laughs> uh, for about a minute with our TV by the time we had it. Uh, and, and you see, you know, I remember going around to the kid's house with the, the video recorder, and, 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 you know, he had a video, and we could watch videos, it was, and we could record programs. Uh, and, and then you see the video recorder come and go, you see the CD come and go, you see the MP3 player come and go, etc., etc., etc. And I say all of that because... You see space station, you think, oh, is it exploration? But you know, you talk to Pierce Sellers, um, he says, you have to understand what we did to make the space station. We turned low Earth orbit into a building site. You know, we had bits of machinery up there. We were delivering gear up there in a space truck. We were hiking it out of the truck and we were bolting it together. And once that was done, once that exploration was done, and that is a feat of exploration because if you can't exist and, and, and establish there, you can't explore in the future, then you use it as a laboratory for the human body. So the exploration becomes looking in rather than looking out. So I still think they're exploring up there. You know, not perhaps the way they might have wanted to when it was first intended, but they're still exploring. You know, we're still exploring in Antarctica. Well, I think it actually depends on your definition of exploration. If you think exploration means being a, you know, macho man and going out on your skis and going to the South Pole single-handed, you know, I don't consider that to be exploration anymore. I think that's personal adventure or extreme sports. Um, and exploration for me is actually going out and discovering new things. And I think Antarctica is absolutely, well, actually, it's not just Antarctica. There's loads of places on the earth where you can go to and discover new things. And you can, you can call it science, if you like, but it is about going out and, think, uh, and discovering new things on understanding how this earth works. And for me, that's exploration. And there is a huge amount of exploration still to do in Antarctica because um, there's lots of places we haven't been to, we can't get to, we, you know, there's lots of places even, I mean, we can go to the Arctic, the exploration actually in the Arctic is what's underneath the sea ice, the sea ice is melting, but we don't know what's underneath the sea ice, we don't know how those ecosystems live under the sea ice and what's going to happen when the sea ice melts. You can go to a desert and there's lots of things we don't know. And I think that the idea of remote places and extreme places are the places where we haven't been and there is still an awful lot we can discover about them. And for me, that's what exploration means. Michael? Probably. Yeah, I thought Jane uh, put it beautifully. And I know amongst uh, some scientists there's this sense that if they only get exhilaration doing their science, if they're away from other scientists. It's like some travelers or tourists have to be away from other British tourists in order to feel that they're experiencing other culture. And I don't think that's true, in fact. And I don't think that those are the conditions for doing interesting science. And even though it's not very extreme, you know, I think it's just as important that people discover exploration here. I want my kids to go to schools where they think London is a place to be curious about. Mm just as much as I want them to be able to go to the Arctic and have that wow experience. So um, I think exploration, first of all, is ch it's meaning changes over the course of history and the kinds of research problems that's attached to change. It's bringing it all back to me beautifully when I was here writing my books and I, the, the, these things, it's almost Pavlovian. Mm. I can feel myself ready to kind of fold things up. There's a question here. 
I know that a true scientist's uh, comfort zone is exploring, researching, generating data and results, but how much time does a scientist invest in actually convincing political and financial leaders of the true meaning of their results and the mm. threats and issues that come nowadays? Great question, thank you. Masses of time, <laughs> masses of time. I mean, um, even more these days, you know, uh, we have to justify the science through a lot of um, assessment exercises and the big word, I think, is impact. What is the impact of your research? But I, I don't actually think that's a fair question because, you know, we do spend public money. Most scientists spend public money and they go out and they do a project and then, you know, how have you justified spending this money? And, um, but an awful lot of time is spent and an awful lot of money actually is spent trying to assess where, where si the impact that science has had. So this government likes to see economic growth, economic impact, uh, but also science impact. I think there is, still a, there is still an understanding that you can do science and you can have a pure scientific discovery and it's not an impact necessarily on economics, it's an impact on the science that we do, which is just as important as any sort of financial aspect. Mm. Other comments? Michael? Well, throughout, his, throughout history, having patrons has for, for men and women of learning always been essential and often, a, of course, a source of great uh, pride and at the heart of the endeavor. Uh, patrons were never far away. One of the most interesting discussions I had with colleagues was at Cambridge a year or two ago was about to what extent patronage persists in the, in the 20th or 21st century. Mm -hmm. Maybe I leave that with, with you to, uh, to think <laughs> about. But I'd only say, certainly in the world of you know, the geography of space and the polar regions, there's uh, no shortage of place names uh, <laughs> to document the significance of patrons. Yeah, that's uh, entirely true, of course. I think this is going to be our last question now before we, um, before we wrap up. So, yeah? Uh, Graham McMillan. What, what concerns me is that Quite often, or most often, um, exploration in extreme environments leads to the development of technologies that then enables man to exploit that environment and to destroy it. And even the Antarctic Treaty System is uh, a temporary system. It, it will fall. Um, do you ever feel any guilt? Oh, great question. And, and in fact, can I take it, there was one other hand that went up here and I felt bad at saying that this is the last question. I can take the two together and then we can answer it. So this is here, yes? So, <laughs> and this is possibly kind of related so um, I was I think it was Dr Walker who made an analogy or said that um, kind of science and exploration is analogous um, and I wonder if there's kind of an analogy between the colonialist ideas of um, exploration and that the western concept of science is the dominant and the real way of understanding the world um, and whether actually uh, the panel thinks that science and extreme environments might be or is an area where traditional or local knowledge is actually as influential on science as science can be on understanding those environments? So two great questions there. So uh, I guess, um, is, is, does science open up areas, vulnerable areas to exploitation and destruction and therefore should we feel guilty about that? And also to what extent is a kind of Western imposition of art, the way we understand the, the landscape, uh, more or less important than, than, than what the people who are already living there, how, how the people who are already mm -hmm. living there understand it? which doesn't actually apply to Antarctic or space, but does apply to the Arctic. So, Michael, you first. Maybe it doesn't apply to those. Um, <laughs> look, historically, there is no doubt about it, right? Science and uh, colonial enterprises have worked hand in hand, not at all times and all places, but consistently throughout modern history. And the textbooks of the history of science show the complicated ways in which that's happened. The really the important point I think you're also getting us to think about, though, is the place of local knowledge. Well, what do local people have to have had to say about this? And it's true that uh, science as a shared enterprise has, has often, if not usually, depended on certain kinds of collaboration. Uh, and there's so many examples. The Ice Age, Louis Agassiz, he got his, uh, his knowledge from people who lived in the Alps and told him that the glaciers move. Uh, the explorers who thought the Northwest Passage, they asked the Inuit, you know, draw the maps, please, show us which way to go. So this has happened throughout history. I think the thing that, that I take great encouragement from is that there's um, 
that there have certainly developed much more serious currents of collaborative research in the last um, several decades. I think they've taken place informally in the past, but now uh, funding bodies are beginning to recognize sometimes that you can achieve uh, more <laughs> if you work with the local people. But in the sense, the question how to decolonize science or how do you know if science is decolonized is a really good one. It's subtle. And Jane, do you think uh, doing research in the Arctic and Antarctic also opens into more exploitation than potential destruction? No, I don't actually. I think the reason why we know that these are very special places is because we do science there. If we hadn't done science, if we hadn't done certain science there, we wouldn't know these were special places that re require protecting. And in fact, a lot of the things we do, especially at British Antarctic Survey, but or, or say in around Antarctica, is there are a lot of scientists who do work that actually. Um, collects data to understand different environments to show that they should be preserved. So an example is, for example, that there are groups of scientists around, around the world that work on the populations of fish and krill and squid and things in the Southern Ocean. And there is a particular part of the Antarctic Treaty, the Convention for Marine and, and, and Living Resources. And it's because of the science that they do that they understand that these are um, vulnerable areas and then they have been protected. And if we hadn't done that science, I think they'd be fished to death. So hooray for the scientists. <laughs> and uh, actually, Kevin, I'm, I'm thinking that our, our exploration of space hasn't left near space environments in a particularly uh, uh, good or tidy state. So, I mean, again, I, you know, let me explain that statement I made that I think science, technology, and exploration are neutral in that just because it's science, it doesn't mean it's good. Just because it's technology, it doesn't mean it's good. Just because it's exploration, it doesn't mean it's good. And you can find very many examples in history of that being true. Uh, and so it's what we choose to do with it. Um, that said, the worry that by doing something, by exploring something and developing a technology, that we may lead to later catastrophe isn't useful because I don't think there is any crystal ball that can tell us whether or not it is the thing that will kill us all or save us. And I would take uh, the, uh, the first laboratory observation of nuclear fission in 1939 by Otto Frisch and Lisa Meitner. You know, they weaponized that in the mid-1940s, at which point we would all say here, yeah, well, what the hell? You know, that's not good, is it? But then, depending on who you talk to about our ability to wean ourselves off fossil fuels, you look at a nuclear bridge to that, and, and that may be the technology that saves us all. So you do, there is no crystal ball that tells you what is going to help and what's not going to help you. Mm. And so, so that's that. And then in terms of local knowledge and science versus the rest of the world, science is, and I do worry about this, every now and again we get into this sort of, I don't know, what is science positivism, like science is the only philosophy that should run everything. And of course, I, I think I feel that science is a way of describing the world mm. uh, and its state. Uh, and, it is, you, and as you get better at it, you get to a closer approximation of the truth, but you never actually get to the truth. Uh, and so in that regard, I think it's a description rather than an explanation. And so in that regard, you need to accept other people's thoughts and try and fold them into your line. But it isn't this thing that is this all-knowing thing. I think it tells you what you can know. And there's a lot that you can never know. So that's what I'd say about that. OK, well, thank you very much. We're now going to start to wrap up the evening. Thanks for some fantastic questions here. I've got a couple more questions to, to put to our, our panellists in the closing remarks. And what I'd really like to know from each of you is, uh, at the beginning, Kevin said that he felt like the age of exploration was dead, or dying, or changing, or slowing. Um, but that's not necessarily the case, but he's seeing some signs that that might be the case. So my two questions to each of you now are, do you think the age of exploration is, is, is of human exploration is going to tail off into nothing? And also, if you got the chance to go to Mars, would you go? <laughs> Michael. Uh, I think it's incredibly important to have places where you would like never to go. Um, <laughs> uh, Mars might be one of mine, but I've got one or two others as well. So, uh, but the, the second question, maybe the, the key one about whether exploration will peter out. No, it's not petering out, it's changing. And I think in the world we live in today, exploration, science more generally, is negotiated. It has to be negotiated because we don't have free licenses to go. To be autonomous in the way that autonomy used to be a kind of uh, 
either political or ideological dream. So I think provided we begin to strip out some of the assumptions about what makes our, our, our lives, our, our, our existence in this world autonomous, this kind of desire for a certain kind of modernist self-control, well, that doesn't mean the end of exploration. That means exploration on different terms. Okay. Um, if we consider exploration about, is about learning something new rather than the classic going somewhere because it's there kind of thing, which is my definition of adventurism and extreme sport. So let's go learning something new. I think there is plenty of things to learn new about the earth or everything particularly in extreme environments, because not so many people have been there. So I think, actually, there's masses more to learn. And would I go to Mars? Yes, but, but via Antarctica. <laughs> Kevin? Um, so, so I don't know. I genuinely think we'll look back at this time. You could look back at this time. So if you regard space as this final human frontier, so if you say that we could continue to be fractal in our exploration of the world and explore it in greater depth and detail, then yes, we'll always continue to explore. If you look at space as a final physical frontier, uh, I, would I would really hope that it's not. I would really hope that exploration will always be something that is physically, physically involved humans. I can see us looking back at this epoch as the point at which we decided that actually, you know, human space exploration, we look at human space exploration as a feat in the way that we look at the pyramids, which is, you know, these magnificent feats that you think, why the hell would they have bothered to do that? And what was that? Well, you know, and, and I can see that possibly being the case. Um, so I don't know, actually. I know what I hope, but whether that is true, I don't, I don't know. So, so I guess it depends. I, I think, actually, that exploration is what all of us do in all of our lives, all of the time. Mm. I really hope that's the case in everything you do, whether you're going up mountains or you're just navigating your own life. I hope so, because otherwise my CV looks really quite dodgy. <laughs> so, 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 so I would say, in some sense, human exploration will always be human, and there will always be exploration. Would I go to Mars? You know what? I've thought about that an awful lot. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, you know, I would have got on a ticket to go into low Earth orbit in a heartbeat. I would go the moon in about two heartbeats. Mars, I would sit down and think about really hard. And uh, I would probably look at my two children and think, mm, probably not. <laughs> Thanks very much, Kevin. So um, I, I, I'm going to answer my own questions, because that's only fair. But before that, I'd like to try a little bit of a, I'm not going to attempt to summarize what's been a fascinating discussion, but I will pick out a few parts of it that I thought were, were particularly interesting, at least to me. And I think, um, we've talked about aspects of exploration which are about things that we need to know and that we don't know that we need to know until we do it. So that's one category of exploration, one reason that there's an exploration imperative. If we don't do that, then we don't survive as a species. And so I, I, I'd say that that's one kind. And, and uh, we talked about whether exploring Antarctica sort of shows how vulnerable it is and how much it needs to be protected. But I would also say that in a way, exploring Antarctica and some of the pioneering, re pioneering research that Jane did showed us that Antarctica doesn't need to be protected. In the past, Antarctica has been hot. It's been covered in ferns and dinosaurs. It didn't care. It doesn't mind whether it's covered in ice or not. But if the ice melts, we're the ones it's coming for. So one of the things that we learn from exploration is how vulnerable we are and, and, and how, what, what we need to do to protect ourselves. So that's one part of the story. There's this, this notion that you can't predict, you can never predict what's going to happen. And that's actually true of almost everything in our lives, we just don't realise it so much. And we were talking earlier before we started this about the financial crash, about how confident economists always are in their predictions, but how they never look back and say, we got it wrong then and then and then and then, oops, we got it wrong then as well, didn't we? And yet there's some extra standard that if you're exploring, you're held to that says, what are we going to get from it and how can we believe you? And in a sense, I, I really like what Kevin just said, that we're exploring all the time in the way that we live, if we're, if we're living right. Um, I think it's interesting that there are some quite, quite real ways in which going to these places give you new eyes. And, uh, and, and, and for example, some of, the, some of the astronomy that takes place in Antarctica is literally looking through different wavelengths, looking, at different, looking via different media to see different things in the universe that you wouldn't have been able to see otherwise. And um, T.S. Eliot said this, that, that, that the aim of travel is to, 
is to change the way that you see, wherever you are. And so there's a sense in which if you're explorers, you're also capable of seeing and seeing and seeing the world with fresh eyes in a way that's essentially, I think, I think is, is very human and is also essential to the human enterprise. Um, I love this comment about you can't underestimate inspiration because we all know that in our hearts. We all know that. And we've all been inspired in some way. The reason that all of us is in the room tonight is because there's something about exploration that has caught our imagination, our hearts and our souls. We're not here for a technical discourse. So you can't underestimate inspiration in the ways that, that we've described in all of this. Um, I just wanted to say, what, do, I, do I think exploration is dead? or dying, or likely to die, or human exploration is likely to die. And, and you make a very compelling argument, Kevin. But I'd, I'd, I'd go back to that point about whenever we predict what's going to happen, we're usually wrong. When, when they said it was the end of physics, along came Einstein. And so on, and so on, and so on. And so I would expect that this might change. But you know, we, we're seeing China that's wanting to go to the moon, so it's ready, ready to, to, to start a manned exploration program to the moon and onto Mars. India is the first country that has ever sent a spacecraft to Mars and got it there successfully the first time and did it at a tenth the price that, uh, that NASA managed it. And it's answer to how can you do that when there are people starving in the streets is this is our way to lift people out of poverty. This is our way to show ourselves as a technological nation. So all of that makes me think that exploration is going on and still going on, even in the big normal way that we talk about it, as well as in our own hearts. But um, there's, two, there's two personal reasons that I'd like to bring in now for, for how I know that exploration is going on and will continue to go on. And one of them is that uh, my husband is an, an, actually an, an astro, uh, astronomer. He's actually at UCL too. And uh, what he's doing now with his, his life and his research is getting school kids to come in and look at stuff about astronomy. It's actually starting tomorrow at UCL. It's called Your Universe. So school children are coming into to, to UCL and graduate students are showing them telescopes and microscopes and cloud chambers and talking about string theory. And these could be eight and nine and ten year olds. And they flock in there with their eyes open wide and they ask the questions and they're deeply curious. And you can feel the passion and the energy in the room when they're doing that. So that's one reason I don't think exploration, human exploration can be dead. And the other reason is I got a lovely uh, photo sent to me by text this morning. This is my five year old goddaughter. She's only little. She's got a bit of attitude, I have to say. And um, young Ruby Evans today is, is, is history day at school, and so she gets to dress up as anyone she wants to from history. She's only five. How many historical figures can she know about, right? And she was asked, what historical figure of all the ones that we've been telling you about, you've heard about, do you want to dress up as today? And the picture they sent me was Amelia Earhart. <laughs> Amelia Earhart. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is my final proof that human exploration is not dead, will not be dead, will never die. And thank you very much to our panel and for all of you for coming tonight. Thanks very much.